miles away. Their route would take the non-violent demonstrators through what amounted to enemy territory, roads and highways controlled by the Alabama State Police. They came toward us, beating up with knife sticks, with bull whips, and tramping us with horses. I was hit in the head and just left lying there. And I, I felt like I was, I felt like it was the last protest. The violence and brutality which ended this march quickly provoked plans for a much larger one. Now joined by Dr. Martin Luther King. We've gone too far now to turn back. Dr. King was determined to focus national attention on Selma, and he enlisted the help of supporters from New York to Hollywood. The Reverend said, the white man can't cool it because he's never dug it. Marlon Brando was the one who got me involved in civil rights, honestly. He, uh, uh, I was walking down the street and he just pulled up in the car and he said, uh, how'd you like to go down to Selma? Yeah? I said, Selma? Selma, we're going to have a march from Selma to Montgomery. You want to come? And I said, sure. Before the second march had even begun, the Reverend James Reeb, a civil rights sympathizer, was beaten to death by a white mob. But rather than intimidating the marchers, that violence seemed to give them a powerful ally. That night, I was with Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma when we heard Lyndon Johnson. We watched him make one of the greatest speeches any American president ever made on the whole question of civil rights. Their cause must be our cause too. It's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. Just think of a president with a southern accent from Texas saying to the Congress of the United States, we shall overcome. Finally, popular protest and public power had come together. And Dr. King literally started crying. Tears came down his face. I knew then that we would make it from Selma to Montgomery. On March 21st, 1965, 3,200 people set out from Selma. Four days later, as the march approached Montgomery, there were 25,000 people marching. It was an amazing moment. It was, it was scary. It was scary. There were helicopters everywhere, like uh, some sort of angry bugs. And there were only Confederate flags flying. We were the only ones with American flags. Yeah, and Martin Luther King gave a great speech. All the world today knows that we are here and we are standing before the forces of power in the state of Alabama saying we ain't going to let nobody turn us around. That's That's right. Right. That's right. That's right. There's very few times in your life that you know that you're at some place that you're at a moment where this is one of those things that as long as there's time is going to be this moment. That was it. United States of America. On August the 6th, Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act, finally guaranteeing black Americans the right to vote. Christine. But just as it reached a high point, the civil rights movement seemed to split into warring factions. A revolution of rising expectations stirs people to believe that the promised land is there. It was when change was coming, when there was a sense of possibility, uh, that everything broke loose and went wild. You are better than the white man. You are better than the white man. And that's not saying anything. Despite the gains of recent years, it seemed to many blacks that the pace of change was too slow, that Martin Luther King was too accommodating. These blacks began to adopt the separatist rhetoric of the charismatic Malcolm X. I used to hear Malcolm say, if a man slaps me in the face, I'm not turning my cheek. If I slap him back, he won't slap me again. That made a lot of sense. 
Malcolm at that time said clearly, all right, what we need is power. While King would say what we need is morality to help uh, bring out, Malcolm said, forget about them, just get guns, and that's how they're going to regulate the problem. The contradiction, however, was that Martin Luther King was involved in action, confronting the enemy. Malcolm X was not. So what you had to do was take the confrontation of King and match it as best you can with the philosophy of Malcolm X, which is precisely what uh, we did. We want black power. We want black power. The response was overwhelming. In 1966, militants in Oakland, California, founded the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and told America that the fight for civil rights would never be the same. If you come down here jumping on us and beating us up like you were beating up the peaceful protesters with your dogs, your cattle prowls, and are shooting them and are murdering these peaceful protesters, we're not going to take it. When you start shooting, we're shooting back. The call by militant leaders for total revolution received a sympathetic ear in many of the nation's impoverished inner cities, where the great society was still nowhere to be seen. Well, in the South, where we had a powerful non-violent movement, people had a way to channel their frustration. In, in many parts of America, especially outside of the South, the fires of frustration, the fires of discontent, were beginning to burn. In 1967, that anger and discontent exploded into violence. In Newark, New Jersey, Detroit, Michigan, and more than a hundred other cities, 80 people died in urban riots that summer. Lyndon Johnson was shocked, I think, at the riots and angry. He took it personally and he got angry at blacks for being ungrateful for how these great laws had been passed. Despite his disappointment, Lyndon Johnson believed that his war on poverty could still succeed. All he needed was more money. Well, the president said to me, you know, we have this uh, war going on now in Vietnam. It's going to take up all of the extra money we have right now uh, to fight that war. But he said, Sarge, look, we're going to be out of that world. We'll, that'll be finished in the next 12 to 18 months. As soon as that's finished, I will take the money we are now are devoting to the war in Vietnam and we'll put it into the war against poverty. Obviously, that never happened. In 1964, a British rock band showed up in the United States that was described by one historian as raunchier and more rebellious than the Beatles. They were called the Rolling Stones. And in the mid-1960s, they created a song that became an anthem. I had one of the first uh, early Norelco sort of cassette players in 1964, five, and I put it next to the bed and I, with the guitar and I crashed out. And when I woke up in the morning, I noticed that the tape had gone to the end, and I'd put it in at the beginning, you know, and I ran it back, pushed play, and somewhere in the middle of the night, I had woken up and played, da, 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 I can't get no satisfaction. And it's there, the verse and the chorus are there, and then it stops, and the rest of the tape is me snoring. You know? <laughs> Rock music had accompanied America's youth on its journey to the forefront of the nation's consciousness with songs like Satisfaction, number one on the charts in 1965. The journey took quite a radical turn. The message is the ordinary order of things is either broken or corrupt I can't get no satisfaction. You go, do something wilder. That's how you'll get your satisfaction. The message, in a sense, is cut loose. It was 
music that gave us as an entity, as a community, a sense of, of, of cohesion and a sense of existing, a real sense of being more than a few demonstrations. The Rolling Stones, Janis Joplin, The Doors, Bob Dylan, all of them sang in a way that invited challenge to the establishment. I think people were absolutely waking up, but they didn't know exactly how to get out of bed yet and what to do when they put their feet on the floor. We began to look around for things to do which would alert people to other possibilities, other ways of living. For some, other possibilities meant completely rejecting the values that had united their parents' generation. I mean, where is it written in stone that people have to work from nine to five? The Haight-Ashbury section of San Francisco became the center of the counterculture. Suddenly, there was uh, an environment where your personal history did not matter. Nobody cared who your parents were, whether you were rich, whether you were poor. You get up every day and you had no idea what the day would bring.